I'm going to open up in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you right now. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. I thank you that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, let them be acceptable in your sight, Father. I pray right now that you remove me out of the way, that your word can reach and accomplish for where you're sending it to this morning. So we thank you and we praise you that you'll do a quick work, cut it short in righteousness, and touch the hearts of these, your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So what we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about praise and worship, mostly worship, because worship is going to be the focus of what we deal with. Now, we know worship is our expression, it's our adoration. We come together in congregations, and we love to worship. Just seeing how we were all worshiping today, we all know that we enjoy worship. And according to Radio Advertising Bureau, around 20 million Americans listen to Christian music on their radio. That's not even counting streaming. That's just radio station numbers. 20 million. They love Christian music. There's also, back in 2019, Hillsong, which is one of the popular churches that promotes praise and worship, they brought in revenues of $100 million in just 2019. So you know there's a great desire and love for praise and worship music. Worship music is made up mostly of two to four bars. Most popular praise and worship songs are longer than the up-tempo songs. And they praise and worship songs usually last between six and eight minutes. And the way they're constructed, they'll start off with a long dynamic chorus, and then in the middle, they'll have three to four bridges, sections that repeat and then slow down. And then they build up into a massive crescendo at the end of acknowledging God and praising him. Now, the most top-rated Christian songs of all times is what would you think that one would be? Amazing Grace. Okay, that's deemed the most popular praise and worship song at all time. Then another very popular one that was right there at the top also was, What a Beautiful Name It Is. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. The most sold Christian song ever was, I Can Only Imagine. I can only imagine. That's the most sold praise and worship song. And then you have songs like How Great Thou Art. There's so many different beautiful songs that we like to join into and we like to share with. And I have over 50 hours of praise and worship music in my catalog. Over 50 hours, because that's all I like. All different kind of Christian genre. I received a playlist from Christopher, sent me his praise and worship list. I got to hear new artists and new songs. I'm like, oh, man, I never heard of them before. So we like to share and learn different people's expression of praise and worship. But I want today not so much to look at the corporate worship and the worship of songs, which are the expression of worship. I want to talk about the heart of worship. I want to talk about the true meaning of worship. What worship really means. Now, there's a biblical interpretational practice called the law of first mention. As it relates to a word used in scripture, it sets the foundation for that meaning. So what this is, is the first place in scripture where a word is used provides the original meaning of that word's use, and it stems from God's intent to that word and how it to be communicated. So when it's first mentioned in the Bible, it, it sets the foundation. God says, okay, when you hear this word for the first time, this is how I want it to be communicated. And then from there, we'll have different expressions and different uses of that word. But it's called the law of first mention. So the first place we see this word worship mentioned in the Bible, it's found in Genesis 22. It's in the story of Abraham sacrificing his son Isaac according to God's request. This event creates the rule, the principle known as the law of first mention of the word worship, and it sets it up for the Old and the New Testament. It says this, So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and rose and went to the place which God had told him. 
Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young son, I mean, said to the young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. And we will come back to you. So this is the first time we hear the word worship. And Abraham is letting us know, I'm going to worship. And what is he going to do? He says, I'm going to worship and I'm going to an altar to sacrifice. Worship is a sacrifice. It's great that we can express it in song and all of these different expressions, but it's our act of sacrifice is what the word worship literally means. And now we see, why, did, why was Abraham so quick to just say, hey, I'm going to find this place. I'm taking a three-day journey. I'm getting ready to offer up my son. Because it tells us in the verse preceding that in Genesis 22:2, it says, this is what God tells Abraham. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountain in which I will show you. See, now we were talking, this young man here, we were talking before service, says, worship is obedience. When we hear from God and we begin to obey, we begin to act, we begin to move out, we begin to express in a way that's going to please God. Abraham simply heard God say, go offer and sacrifice your son. And then Abraham said, hey, he rose up early, it says, in the morning to do this. He didn't wait. When we're ready to begin to really sacrifice to God, we can't wait till we come in on Sunday. And I love the praise and worship, but it's something that needs to be done in our everyday lives. When Abraham found the place God described, the Bible tells us this is his words of faith. Faith is also a part of our worship. He says, the lad and I will go yonder and worship. Worship is offering to God a sacrifice, something that we love. Worship is the action, the declaration that we put in God, putting him first above everything else in our life. God knows we love things and people and nice and, you know, we want the different comforts of life. Hey, we're human. But when we're able to put all of those things on the altar before God because he's requiring it, because he wants something else from us, he wants to bless us in ways that we don't yet see. Worship is the action that we take. It's the sacrifice that we surrender to God. It is something you give up. It's something you love, but there's nothing that we can give up that God doesn't bless us with more. It's when even when we have a right to feel a certain way, we don't live according to our feelings. We live according to God's word. Now, when I was in an academy, which is one of the classes that, we, that we, Prison Fellowship puts on, on this last Friday, I heard a real interesting story. This one guy, he was telling the story, right? He's believing he's going to get out in a year. But he tells a story of, he said, the reason I'm in here, he said, I hadn't got into an argument with my neighbors. And my neighbors had a bat, and they were cussing and yelling and screaming, and they were coming on my property. He said, I went and got my gun, and I shot it in the air. Boom, boom, shot it twice. He said, and then someone called the police, and da, 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 and I was just like saying, hey, they came in on my property and did this, and they gave him 30 years. They gave him 30 years for shooting the gun in the air. He didn't point it, he shot it in the air. 30 years. He's done 17. And uh, he said, now some Justice League people are coming, they're looking at his case, to, so he's hoping to get out soon. But what he said was so important. He said, and I... Every day I was thinking, when I get out of here, I'm going to finish. I'm going to do what I should have did back then. He said, I had all of these thoughts every single day. But he's in the class. We're going over resolving everyday conflict, having all of these classes about what God does in our hearts and how, you know, when we're committed to God, God is first. He said, this is the first year ever that I forgave him. He said, I released him is the word he said. He said, I just released him. He said, it doesn't matter what they did, injustice, he said, I released them and I feel free. When I get out of here, I'm not thinking about them. I know what God has done in my life and I know how I need to live from here. I'm good for the rest of my life. Amen. See, he understood that even though I'm offended, 
When I'm a child of God, I can't keep those offenses and I can't be looking at other people because of what they did to me, even when they were wrong. Even when I spent 17 years incarcerated, he said, I released them. See, we really have to think about the th issues and the things that we have in our lives because there may be some things in our life that we need to release. It doesn't mean that I agree with what was done to me or what happened, but it means for the sake of who I am in Christ, I am releasing them. See, worship is also our actions of faith, our words of faith. It's when we don't hold anything that's not according to God's word, we don't hold close to that. See, Abraham was worshiping, declaring the character of God when he said, me and the lad will come back. He was saying, by some means or by some way, God is going to make this situation right. See, when God is calling us to something, he's going to make that situation right. When we follow and when we respond in obedience, he's going to do it right. Paul tells us in Romans 4, 17 through 22, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed. God who gives life to dead things calls those things which do not exist as though they do, who contrary to hope, in hope believed. So he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. So shall his descendants be. See, Abraham heard from God. And when he heard from God, Nothing in this life was going to stop him from following and obeying what God put on his heart to do. Even though it looked like contrary to hope was to take what God gave me and to kill it, that doesn't make sense. But Abraham says, no, if God, you tell me to do something, I'm going to do it. Because in the end, God, your will will prevail. And Paul is letting us know, contrary to hope, he even went against what he was hoping for. How many of us are believing and trusting and hoping for things in life, and are we willing to release those things if God tells us? Or are we saying, no, God, I have to have this. I, I have to do this, God. I've been wanting this. I've been believing you, God. You told me you are going to do this, and we stay so focused on that. And we can stay locked in to even a promise from God when God wants to do a new thing. He's got a greater promise for you. He's got greater blessings for you. But we can't have our hands so closed and so tight to what God has given us that he can't give us anything else. He can't bless us with anything else because we're holding on to that last word, that last promise he gave us. And God says, but I got something else now. I got a new assignment for you. I got something even better than that one. But we're so holding on to what we have we, our hands can't be open to what God can give us next. Because, see, God made this promise in Genesis 15, 5. And it says this. Then he brought, he was talking to God, and Abraham had a conversation. Then God does this. Then he brought him outside and said, look, now towards the heavens, and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. See, when God makes a promise, sometimes our actions and our lifestyle and what we're going through doesn't look like what God promised. It doesn't look like it's going to come to pass. But, God's, but Abraham is saying, if God, if you say that's going to happen for my son Isaac, then I'm willing to lay him down on the altar. I'm willing. That's the willingness Abraham is talking about. And it also says, when we continue on there, it says in Romans, it says, as we continue the story of Abraham, it says, and, being, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body not being weak in faith. That's when my situations aren't looking a certain way. I got to speak God's word. I got to believe God's word. I got to trust God's word. I can't be weak in my faith when the situation and the enemy wants me to be weak. The enemy wants me to think and to go this way and go that way. The enemy wants me to compromise what God has told me to do. We can't compromise when God is leading us. All we have to do is, like Abraham, we have to obey. We have to go. We have to do it. He said he didn't consider the weakness of his body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promises of God through unbelief, 
but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. What is our worship? Giving glory to God. When our faith is challenged and our situations are hard and we're giving glory to God, that is our worship. Worship is not just Sunday. Great when we can come together and enjoy the presence of, the God, of God. But worship is our everyday life. It's what, what, how we're communicating with God each and every day. That was his worship. He was giving glory to God and being fully convinced, it says, that what he had, what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Therefore, it was accounted to him as righteousness. The things you're believing God, are you trusting and believing that God can accomplish that even in your life? You may not have the skills, the connections, and the resources that other people have, but do you believe God can yet do that in your life? Can he yet bring that to pass? Are you, are you believing like Abraham? She's like, Abraham said, I'm convinced. And it says, fully convinced. See, fully convinced. Not that I believe it, I hope it. He was fully convinced. See, God told Abraham to offer up his son as a sacrifice, but he supplied a ram in the bush. So Abraham didn't have to do it. But God shows his love for all of us and his willingness to offer up his son, because it says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God's goodness knew that Abraham giving up his son wasn't going to benefit him. So God provided a ram for Abraham's son. But for his son, there was no ram. For God's son, Jesus, there was nothing but a cross, and he put his lamb on a cross. For you and I, God gave his, he experienced the loss of a child. And he did it for you and I. Sacrifice is something that we give, but we can never give more than what God has already given. Worship is that transitional moment in our lives where we allow God to have preeminence, over everything we have, everything we believe, everything we're hoping for, God, you are greater, and I'm turning that over to you. See, that's the worship. That's the sac. That's where we're at. That's why Abraham is considered the father of our faith. Why? Because he didn't waver. Because he walked the path God had for him. Even if it was going to cost him his son, Abraham was willing to give that up. See, we can always say and, and, and make excuses why we don't understand and why we don't offer certain sacrifices. But see, Abraham had to let go of God's old promise and receive his new promise. Worshiping is our surrender. It's something that God has promised, and even when we're not clear about that promise, it's something that God will bring to pass. It's not something that we bring to pass. And it takes a process of maturity, it takes a process of struggle, and it takes a process of staying the course. So there was a story about a, um, a worship pastor. He took his wife out for their anniversary. And they were at this upscale restaurant, and he's like, oh, wow, we're here for the first time. He saved up his money. And while they were waiting, the, the head person over wine and beverages came out and started speaking to him, making small talk. So he asked the guy, he says, what's the difference between an expensive bottle of wine and at least an average common bottle of wine. And the expert, oh, he loved this conversation. He said, let me tell you something like this. He said, there's a variety of grape grown on a tropical island in the Mediterranean, the island's named Santoroni. And in Santoroni, there grows this vine that grows out of the side of the mountain, out of the side of the rocks. And where it grows, it gets beaten by the salty waters beat upon that vine. The scorching sun, when the, when the tide is out, it scorches the, the vine. Then the wind comes and knocks the vine because there's no protection for the vine. And the vine is in, that, is, is in that environment year after year after year. It, he said it takes 15 years for that vine to mature and be ready for the harvest of the grapes. 15 years of going through that cycle year after year after year. And after it's gone through that cycle year after year, in 15 years it matures and it becomes the finest, most expensive wine you can buy on earth. 
our worship and our lives, it's kind of like that vine. We got to go through things. Life may be hitting us. We may be going through all kinds. But when we stay the course, when we mature in Christ, when we allow our worship to be what brings us through, I ask you, do you have an altar that you go to? When Abraham finally got to the place, he said we went to the altar to offer up his son. It's important for us to have an altar that we go to each day. Where is our altar? It can be a place in your home. It can be your passenger seat in the car. It can be a sofa in the living room. It can be a porch swing. But it's important to have that place that we can go to, that we can worship God, and we can begin to have that intimate one-on-one time with God. That's worship. That's worship on a day-to-day basis. And another person I want to talk about, when we talk about worship, I said, I can't leave out David. David, without very little argument, is one of the greatest expressors and worshipers of God, writing most of the Psalms, and the Psalms that he's written are so beautiful, and and we know David as a worshiper. Before he was king, before he was all these things, he was always been a worshiper. But then when you look at David's story in 2 Samuel, when it talks about he leaves the Ark of the Covenant, he leaves it in the house of Obed Eden. Because he didn't like what God did to Uzzah when they were bringing the Ark back to, supposed to be back to with, with Judah, with David. When they were bringing the Ark back, the Ark tilted and Uzzah tried to stabilize it and touched it and God killed him. And David didn't understand that. See, sometimes we're going through life and we don't understand certain things, and it makes us want to kind of separate ourselves from God a little bit. Because David couldn't understand that, and this is what it tells us in um, Samuel 6, 12 through 14. So David leaves the Ark of the Covenant in his house, and David goes on. David says, I just don't understand, God. I don't understand why you did that. I I don't want that Ark with me. But this is what God does. Now, 2 Samuel 6, 12 through 14 says, Now it was told King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Eden and all that belongs to him, because the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Eden to the city of David with gladness. See, David says, wait a minute. I didn't want that. But where the presence of God is, there's always blessing." There's always blessing. So when David hears that, David says, no, let's get that ark. You know, I don't want that house blessed. I want my house blessed. So he went, he goes and he gets it with gladness. And so it was when those that were bearing the ark of the Lord, when they went six paces, that he sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep. Then David danced before the Lord with all his might. So now we see how worship and sacrificing are going hand in hand. They're taking literally six paces, stopping, and they're worshiping by offering sacrifices. And David, he's doing what David does. He's dancing before the Lord. It says, wearing the linen ephod, and that's a, that's a garment that priests wear underneath their robes. So David is dancing, they are sacrificing, and David is saying, God, even though I didn't understand that before, I want you with me now. I need you now. I need your blessings. David is such a worshiper, a true worshiper, he didn't even want just the the priests that had the ark that were offering the sacrifice to be the ones to worship God. David says, I'm going to dance. David was king. If David didn't want... If David wanted the ark brought, he didn't have to go do it. He could have sent his armies to take the ark and bring it to him. But David's love for God wouldn't allow that. David said, I left the ark when I was with the ark there. So I'm going back, God, to show you, no, I want you. I want to be with you. I want to worship you. I want to dance before you. And the Bible says David danced practically out of his clothes when he was dancing before the ark. Because David went back to God. And said, God, I want to be in your presence once again. I didn't like what happened, and I kind of deviated, but I'm going back into the presence of God, and I'm going to dance before you. I'm going to dance. I'm going to worship. David was such a worshiper. It says in 
But Psalms 34, 1 through 3, David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. It says, my soul shall make its boast in the Lord. It says, the humble shall hear of it and be glad. It says, oh, come, magnify the Lord with me. See, that's when we get into the corporate praise. It says, and let us worship the Lord together. See, that's where we are. That's what we do when we come together. We come together to worship the Lord together. But we're not coming just to do it when we're here. This is kind of like the, the blessing on top when we're all on one accord, we're all can praise God together. This is easy to praise and worship God when we're all together. But it's nothing like when we can praise and worship God when we're by ourselves, when we don't understand, but we're yet trusting and believing God. When God says no sometimes in our lives, what I believe no stands for, it stands for next opportunity. Next opportunity. Doesn't come when we want it, but God says, I got another opportunity for you. See, it says in Psalms 29, 2, it says, give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. See, we need to do that on a day-to-day -day basis because his mercies are new every morning and great is his faithfulness. So when I wake up and I'm worshiping, I'm saying, God, have your way. Lead me today, God. You're in control on today. It says in Psalms 22, 3 through 5, it says, But you are wholly enthroned in the praises of Israel. Oh, our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried to you and, you were and they were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. See, the psalmist understands and they're saying that the reason I'm praising God is not just for what he does in my life. It's what I saw him do in my life. Father's life, the prayers of my mother that have brought me food. We see some of those examples even in, in our church today. We often hear Pastor Will talk about his mother, Mother Yancey, how she would make decisions and sacrifices for the family, how she worked those things out, how they had to cut back on this and couldn't have this and had to eat this, but then everything would work because she was a worshiper. She worshiped daily. He got to see that in his mom. He got to see how she did and what she did. She was that worshiper. She became an example to him. Amen. Right? Yeah. When the, you have someone in your life, we got to look at them. Psalmist says, because of what I saw you do it with my father, they trusted you, and they were not ashamed. We look at our parents and those that go before us, how we trust and how we worship and how we see them overcome that we can overcome too. See, the different programs and all the different things we do here, I look at Mother Smith, how faithful she is. I look at her volunteer there when I'm talking to her on the phone. She's taking care of some little ones here. Yeah. It's her faithfulness, looking at the family that she raised and the legacy that she has and the love that's in that family unit. That is her legacy. That is the worship. What we're seeing is not what she does here. What we're seeing is what she does in private. And that private intimacy time with God creates the life that we get to see, that we get to enjoy, that we get to be blessed with. We got to have that faithfulness of our works that we do as we do it as unto the Lord. Amen. When we come together, when we worship, like David was that dancer, he was that praiser. It blesses me when Sister Gina is dancing down here. She's just dancing before the Lord. That's the beauty of holiness. Amen. That's what we're called to do. We need to have that expression of love that we can give to God in our individual ways. Because God is looking for such to worship him in spirit and in truth. And I'm not just talking about worshiping God in spite of your situations. I'm talking about worshiping God in your situations. And like Abraham, what is God calling you to lay down? What is God asking you to lay on the altar before him? What is it that we have and we're still kind of dangling with and we're kind of, God, okay, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm with you, God, but I'm kind of taking care of this myself. Are we kind of like David? Are we leaving the ark, that intimate time with God's presence? Are we being a little separated from that because of what we didn't understand and what we didn't want? There comes a point to where we have to just face Whatever it is in our lives, and we got to take it to the altar. 
We got to take it and we have to be willing and not just willing to sacrifice that to the Lord. So as I close, I just want to encourage us to understand our worship and create that day activity, that day time of how we're going to worship God, how intentional can we be in how we worship God, how we can really create and develop our expression of worship. We may not can dance like this, or we may can't sing. I love to hear Pastor Will when he's leading worship and, and Sister Anita when she's singing. Oh, that's beautiful. But guess what? I can't sing like them. <laughs> you know, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't have anybody if it was up to me. But I love being there and being able to lift my hands and wave and sing and being drowned out by their voices in the music. But it's so important for us to have our daily life of worship. I just want to encourage us this morning to say, God, I want, to, I want to be more intentional in my worship with you. Because, see, praise is when we're acknowledging what God has done, but worship is acknowledging who God is. See, God doesn't have to do anything for me to worship him. I worship him because of what? When he gave his son, his lamb that died on the cross for my sins and everything I will go through. So I can worship him no matter what's going on in my life. If I have what I want, if I have what I don't want, if I don't have my needs met, I can still worship my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who came and died for me. So there's a reason why we worship. You don't have to look far to worship. You have to look in to worship because that's where he is. Amen. So I want to just offer to pray with anyone that desires to say, God, I want to come and have that intimate relationship with you. I want to be at the altar of God right now. God, just take me and do me over. And I, and I always ask God, do me over. Because uh, yesterday, oh, man, God, I need a new one today. <laughs> oh, man. So, so as I'm closing, I would like to pray for those that saying, God, I, God, I want something new today. God, I, I want a, a touch. I want a change on the inside today. I want a more intimate relationship with you. I want to be that person that responds instantly when I hear your voice, even when I don't understand. I want to just respond and, and tell you yes. So if you can stand to your feet as I pray and close, and if there's someone watching or someone that says, I don't know Jesus even in the pardons of my sins. I want to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. That's the gift that God gave in giving us his son. It says, if you ask, you will receive. If you ask Jesus to come into your heart right now, just say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of all of my sins. I ask you to come into my heart. I want you to be my Lord and Savior. Speak to me and lead me. Help me to follow after you, and I'll serve you all of my life. Father, I pray for each and every one of us standing. Oh, Lord, have your way in our lives. Your word says, he who began a good work, that you're faithful and just to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So I ask you to do a work in their lives, Father God. Do a work in our life that we can receive and be the men and women that you've called for us to be for such a time as this. Father, allow our spirits and minds to be quieted that we can hear the small, still voice directing us and guiding us, Lord. The areas of our lives that we need to sacrifice, Lord, we put them on the altar before you right now. Oh, Heavenly Father, take those things from us. As we lay them, we're going to walk away from them, Lord God. We know that you said that you take our sins, you cast them as far as the east is from the west. You said you remember them no more. Help us in areas of our lives, Lord God, that we're kind of slacking in, Lord. You know the areas. You know what you call for us to do. If we're living beneath your privilege, Father God, bring us up, raise up a standard, Father God, that we can walk out, that we can trust, and we can believe, Lord God. We cannot waver, Lord God, and be solid in our faith. Allow us to demonstrate and to live a life that is pleasing in your sight. But we truly worship to an audience of one. 
As we leave this place, Father, let us not leave your presence. We thank you, Lord God, that time can be set aside, that we truly meet you intentionally and just worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So we pray this morning, have your way in Jesus' name. Amen.